changing it up. <laughs> Sorry.
This morning's scripture reading is Romans 12, 1 through 2. So brothers and sisters, because of God's mercies, I encourage you to present your bodies as a living sacrifice that is holy and pleasing to God. This is your appropriate priestly service. Don't be conformed to the patterns of this world, but be... but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you can figure out what is God's will is, what is good and pleasing and mature. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. <laughs> Y'all grab a seat. Thank you. My name is Wade. It's great to have everyone here this morning. Thank you for, for joining us in worship. You have a choice every Sunday morning, and you made the choice to be here, so thank you. And if you are a guest of ours, we especially thank you for being here. We know it can be really scary visiting a church, and our trust and our hope is that you have a great experience of God's grace. We also want to welcome those who are worshiping with us online. We have a growing contingent of folks that worship with us online, and so we want them to feel welcome as well. When you walked in, we want to make sure that you got one of these. This is what we call a GPS. If you don't have one, then raise your hand, and someone in the back will make sure that you have it. It's got some information about the church that we want you to be aware of. It's also got three inserts that I want to point out to you. One is you'll see a yellow insert that says, Who is my neighbor? If you've been with us at all over the last three weeks, you've seen this before. But now that you've seen it, we want to encourage you to act on it. So in the middle is where you put your address. And then the challenge is that square and name everyone who lives around you. And if you can't, then why not? That's about knowing our neighbors and loving our neighbors. And so if you've already got that filled out and you know every neighbor, then fantastic. If you don't, then maybe this will be a challenge to, that as a disciple, how can you get to know your neighbors, at least just their name? You also see an insert about Sunday school and porch groups. If you are a, an active part of a porch group or a Sunday school class, just where you're sitting, could you raise your hand? Uh, loud and proud, please. Loud and proud. All right, now put that down. Let me ask you this different question. If you love your Sunday school class or porch group, will you raise your hand loud and proud? Okay, now keep your hand up, don't be shy. Now, if you look around you and find someone who doesn't have their hand raised and you are enthusiastic about your group, then why are you waiting to invite them? Invite someone who doesn't have their hand up because if you sense that God is moving in your group, oh, you all put your hands down. That's pretty convenient, all right? So keep your hand up and invite someone who doesn't have their hand up because that's where life is. Okay, you can put your hand down. Also, you'll see an insert about upcoming classes and events that are taking place this fall. We want you to be a part of it. We're not trying to add more work to your schedule. We're already really, really busy. But we're trying to be busy about the right things. And so if there's something on this list that you want to be a part of, it may mean to say yes to this. You've got to say no to something else. But we want you to consider that. So please keep that in mind. You'll also see on the back side a grow, pray, and study guide. We want to encourage you to utilize that not only for this morning, but through the service as well. I've got a couple announcements about staff and about the people who've joined the church. So last week we had a new partner dinner. And if you're not sure what partner means, some of you may be familiar with the term membership. It's like that, but a lot different. And we had about 50 people who showed up last week. And we had 34 people all together join the church last week. So we can give God thanks for that. And if you partnered up with the church last week, could you just raise your hand where you are? A lot of hand raising today. Yeah, we want to welcome them. Excellent. So in just a few minutes, you're going to meet and greet and find someone you haven't said hi to this morning. And those are people that you can say hi to. Also want to introduce Blake. Britt, where's Blake? Blake, once you and Kara come down here, let's give it up for Blake as, and Kara as they make their way to the front. And want to let you know that, that Blake is our new youth, youth leader. And today is his first day and Kara is his bride. And so we wanted you to see them. And great things are ahead for the youth ministry. And so we wanted you to be aware of them. And now that you've seen everybody, you can get them to work. All right, so let's give it up for Blake and Kara as I head back to your seats. Thank you all very much. Last announcement I'd like to make is that uh, we're going to be going through a change and transition in our children's ministry. 
Uh, Miss Kim, who's led the children's ministry for about six years now, she has tendered her resignation effective September 13th. She's done a great job, but she's entering into a new stage of, of life where she and her husband are wanting to start a family. And so we're thankful for them. They're still going to be a part of this church, but we're beginning the process of looking for our next generation children's leader. And so we want to encourage you to be in prayer about that. Also, when you see Kim and Stephen back, I think they'll be back next week, say hi to them and come alongside them and hug them and love them because they're still going to be a part of our church. But we wanted you to be aware of that so that you, if you know of people that we may need to, to visit with, let me know and we'll visit with them. Okay, so glad that everyone is here this morning. Now, I want to encourage everybody, I, I want the love of Jesus that is testifying to your heart to testify to your face this morning. All right, so if you are glad to be here, can I, can I just see a smile this morning? Just a, just a little bit of a... It's tough up here without smiles coming back, all right? So just a little bit of smile. Now, now that you've practiced that, I'd like for you to stand up and find someone you have not said hi to this morning, smile at them, and greet them. Hi. Texas Rangers? Are you a Rangers fan? Awesome. Hi. Also, we're going to the game. Oh, that's right. Right after church. Can you say hi? <laughs> Daddy, I can Oh. <laughs> Wayne, let's go. Let's get it going. Okay. Hey, Bruce. How are you?
the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Lift your eyes to heaven, there is freedom. Yeah. Lift your eyes to heaven.
we thank you for. At this time, I'd like to ask the ushers to come forward for a time of offering. And as they come, just close your eyes and just be reminded of the freedom that God gives us each and every day. The freedom to, to worship, the freedom to pray, the freedom to do the things that we get to do. And though we do have suffering in this world, we do suffer things, and each of us, each of us have something that we deal with we can come to this place freely to worship and bring our concerns and our things to you. So Lord, as we give today, may we give a humble heart knowing that our, through our gifts we bring freedom to others as well. To start a new life maybe. To begin a new thing like Sandy Beach. To do new outreach in our community. To bring you to our world. Father, I thank you so much. In Jesus' name, amen.
Romans 8.18, it says, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. Father, this morning, open our ears, open our minds, open our hearts, open our souls to hear your word, to hear your message, that we may continue. Though we suffer, though we go through this and that, that we still love you, God, and we receive that love from you, that we may share it with our neighbors, that we may be that example of your grace and love to others. Lord, be with way this morning. May you anoint him with your Holy Spirit, that your Holy Spirit may flow freely in this place. That it be your words that we need to hear today. May we take it and may we share it through your love and grace. Amen. May we see you. Can we give God thanks for the band that we have? <laughs> Wayne has done a great job being our interim leader for these last few months, and next Sunday is going to be his last Sunday with us for a while. But he's, he loves his church, and he's a friend of our church, and I'm sure if we ever called on him, he would come back in a heartbeat. And so uh, Jordan, who's playing keyboards, will be our... Uh, our praise band leader. They're transitioning over these next few weeks, but Jordan will be our praise team leader. And I'm so thankful for every component of this band. They sound great this morning and give glory to God. So I'm thankful for that as well. So thankful that you're here this morning as we get ready for the, the sermon. Can I invite you just to take a deep breath? And let me lead us through a time of prayer. It may not be for you, it may be for me, but let's spend some time in prayer for just a moment before we head into the sermon. Lord Jesus, we thank you. You are wonderfully gracious, and we give you so much thanks for who you are and who we are through you. Uh, God, we pray that by the power of your Holy Spirit, you will continue to move in and through this place and in and through your people and in and through the people who don't even know that you have claimed them yet. Lord, this is your time, and we are your people. This is your place. Inhabit this place. Fill us with your presence so that through what I say or in spite of it, Lord, we may catch a glimpse of your grace. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So are, are you willing to adjust your plans for God's plans? I would love to tell you that from the moment that I took my first breath, I've always been willing to adjust my plans to God's plans, but that has not been the case. And I was growing up, and before Michelle and I got serious, I was single. And then at some point, I decided that I didn't want to be single anymore, and I wanted to be connected with Michelle. And as soon as that decision happened, and she made the decision in return that she wanted to be with me, then immediately my life changed because I can no longer live as a single person, right? Now, you and I know plenty of people who are married and have kids who still try to live as single people, but it just doesn't work. And so at that moment, my whole organization, if you will, as to how I lived as a single person and how I allocated my resources were completely changed once Michelle and I got connected. And once we got connected, we were married for three years before Hannah came around. And Hannah was a joyful surprise when she showed up. And she's our oldest. She's 20 years old right now. And when Hannah came around, it sent us through a great re, uh, reorganization of our structure so to speak, as to how we lived as a couple. Because we had to get into the mindset that now how we organize and how we allocate our resources had to be adjusted to another person coming into the fold. We couldn't just spend money like we did before because now we had another mouth to feed. And then Jacob showed up. And Jacob really threw us for the loop because going from one kid to two is a little bit of an adjustment for those of you who experienced that. And so our organization and our resources adjusted again. And then 10 years later, when Caleb showed up, our organization as to how we were living as a family of four had to be adjusted to how we were living as a family of five and how we spent our money and how we spent our time and how we spent our resources. And then soon after Caleb came, Rebecca showed up. And when Rebecca showed up, our organization and our resources had to be adjusted. We could not live as if we only had one child. Now we had four. And not only did we have four, but we had a 12-year-old, a 10-year-old, 
I'm sorry, a 13-year-old, 11-year-old, a two-year-old, an infant in the household. Now, let's go to this week. This week on Wednesday, I took Caleb and Rebecca to Acton Elementary, dropped them off at 7.30 that morning. That was an adjustment for me. And there were a few tears that were shed by me when I did that. And then when I went home, I picked up Jacob, who's now a freshman in college, and I sent him, or I took him, I didn't send him, I actually took him, and dropped him off at his dorm at the University of Mary Harden Baylor in Belton. So now we're back to two kids and our organization and our resources have changed while we have two college kids. So you get what I'm saying here? Life is full of change and it's full of transition and it's full of reorganizing and it's full of being willing to adjust plans, but also willing, being willing to adjust your plans as God sees fit so they can be changed by God's plans. And that's what I want to talk with you about today because the scripture that we have today is an example of God interrupting something and people's plans changing for God's plans. So in Acts chapter 6, here let me give you a little bit of backstory. The early church is growing. Jesus has resurrected. The power of the Holy Spirit has fallen on his church. And when I say church, I'm not talking about brick and mortar. They didn't have brick and mortar back then. The greatest resource that the church had back then as well as the greatest resource that the church has now are the people. Let me say that again. The greatest resource that the church had back then, as well as the greatest resource that the church has now, are the people. Let me say it one more time, because I don't think the mic is picking up here. The greatest resource that the church had back then, as well as the greatest resource that the church has today, are the people. All right, and anytime you get people involved, stuff happens. All right? So at this time, the church is growing. Disciples are being made. It's, it's growing. It's burgeoning. I mean, they're experiencing great growing pains. But then all of a sudden, within the tension of this growth, there begins to be some complaints. And the complaints are coming from a group that's not being ministered to that are widows. Now, back in the day, the Jewish community, which Christianity came out of Judaism, back then in the day, Judaism took it upon themselves to care for widows. And back in that day, women would marry young and they would usually marry older men. Well, as the women and men got older, the men would die off and they would leave widows. And it wasn't up to the government. It was up to the community of faith to care for the widows. So you had this growing movement of these people, but then all of a sudden there's some tensions within it because you've got this growing number of widows that are not being taken care of. They're growing pains. So here's what happens in Acts chapter 6. During this time, as the disciples were increasing in numbers by leaps and bounds, hard feelings developed among the Greek-speaking believers, the Hellenists, toward the Hebrew-speaking believers because their widows were being discriminated against in the daily food lines. So think about it this way. The Hebrew believers, those were the ones that were born in that area. So they were there. And then you had these outsiders. It's kind of like newcomers coming into the church. And the newcomers coming into the church, I'm just using our language today, they were coming in and they were taking more and more time and resources and there began to be complaints. That makes sense? So there was a disruption between two cultures. So the 12 called a meeting of the disciples and this 12 were like the original 12 that hung out with Jesus. They said, it wouldn't be right for us to abandon our responsibilities for preaching and teaching the word of God to help with the care of the poor. So friends, choose seven men from among you whom everyone trusts, men full of the Holy Spirit and good sense, and we'll assign them this task. Meanwhile, we'll stick to our assigned tasks of prayer and speaking God's word. And the congregation thought this was a great idea. And so they went ahead and chose Stephen, a man full of faith and the Holy Spirit, Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicholas, a convert from Antioch. Then they presented them to the apostles, the twelve. In praying, the apostles laid hands and commissioned them for their task, and the word of God prospered. The number of disciples in Jerusalem increased dramatically, not least a great many priests submitted themselves to the faith. So not, not only do I want you to think about the tensions that are prevalent in your own life as you go through life stages, and there, there are challenges that are presented to you every day. 
And when those challenges present themselves to you, you can respond in a couple different ways. One is you can dig your heels in and resist the change in transition. You can be the last holdout. You can go, I'm never going to change. That's everyone else's problem. It's not mine. Or you can amend your plans to God's plans. And this is what is happening with the early church. All this tension is beginning to happen because of growing pains. And the 12, those who had first-hand account with Jesus, they could have relied on their positional authority and said, look, we're the 12. We had time with Jesus. We're not going to waste our time with this meaningless thing. Y'all go do whatever you want to do. But instead of doing that, they didn't focus on their positional authority as the 12. They focused on their relational authority. Their relational authority is who they were in God and who they Now, some of you may know that my official title at this church, it's seen sound just full of authority. And, and I was here years ago on staff and I wasn't senior pastor. I was a pastor. That's what I was back then. Now, there's a certain level I can use my positional authority to hold sway with you and influence you. And I can tell you, look, this is just the way it's going to be. But there's going to be a point where that positional authority begins to, to lose influence with you if I don't back it up with my relational authority. participated in that, and some of you haven't. It's been great for me just to listen. You've asked me some questions many times, but many of you, you just want me to hear what's going on with you and with the group. And that's great. That's why I wanted to do it. But I took that model. It wasn't just because I'm a nice guy and I just want to spend time with you. It's because that's what the original 12 did. They took time and they listened to people. It doesn't mean that they were giving away their authority. It's because of who they were that gave them authority to listen to folks. And so over these 20 sessions, and I think we have a few more that are coming, and we want you to participate in it, the, the, the disciples listened, and so I figured we should listen as well when there's conflict and when there's not. They also didn't just listen, but they also knew what their role was. As the original 12 listened to the crowd, they were very clear as to what their role was. Their role was to focus on preaching and proclaiming the word of God. Their role was not to minister to the poor. And some of you are like, that just seems rude. Why wouldn't they? They spoke really clearly as what the character of these new leaders were to be. Now, in church world, what I want you to understand is in church world, we have non-paid administrative teams behind the scenes. They're made up of people like you. You're not on staff, but you, you support and encourage and participate in the life of the church. And we have three main families within the church that I call group, not blood families, but if you've ever seen The Godfather, you know, you had head of the three families. All right, so... In the church world, that's finance, and that's trustees, and that's the SPR or the staff parish relations team. And many times in church world, we try to focus on people who have different skills and gifts to be able to do that. But can I tell you what the original 12 said were the criteria? The original 12 said the criteria for people who are going to be in leadership is this, and I want you to write this down and remember this. The, one of the criteria was that it's someone that everyone trusts. That's the first criteria. It's someone that everyone trusts. Second criteria is that they would be filled with the Holy Spirit. That it's not just that they talk a good game, but that they're filled with the Holy Spirit. And the third criteria, and I love this, is that they have good sense. Okay, good sense means that they're going to speak when it's appropriate. They're going to keep their mouth shut when it's appropriate. If they're not going to cause fires, they're going to help put them out. They've got good sense. That was a criteria for leadership. And then the original 12 who had great positional authority, they delegated the tasks with no strings attached. So let me ask you again, are you willing to adjust your plans for God's plans? Because that's what the original 12 were doing. And then here's what happened. Spirit-filled leaders were chosen from the group that were feeling alienated and marginalized. They picked the leaders and they were spirit-filled leaders. And then the new leaders were publicly legitimized by the 12. So for example, in January, we're going to have a new leadership class that comes through. And at the first of the year, we're going to call all those leaders to come forward and we're going to pray over them and set them apart because it legitimizes the work that you're doing. You're missionaries and we want you to be in the mission field doing what needs to be done. And then here's what happened. The word of God prospered and many more disciples were made. So if you're not willing to adjust your plan, you've done really good work. And I was thinking, yeah, it's been pretty awesome, pretty hard work. And he goes, you know, 90% of churches never get to where you are. And I go, 
yeah, I know it. I'm, I'm pretty awesome, right? That's what I was thinking. And he goes, you should really celebrate. And as he was talking, my ego was getting bigger and bigger. And I was like, yeah, you know what? I plan on celebrating and, you know, it's going to be great. Michelle is really excited. And then he said this. He said, but you know what got you to 120 is not going to get you to 150. And I went, ugh. And he said, what gets you to 150 is not going to get you to 200. And he said, what gets you to 200 people is not going to get you to 300 people. And he kind of went kept on keeping on and where at the time my ego was getting really big and blown up and by the end I was like a balloon that had all the air you know let out of it at that time because what he was saying was that in order for the church to go through these changes and adjustments and handle these conflicts that were going to rise with growing pains the one person who was going to have to change the most was me And I didn't want to hear that because I want God's plans to adjust to my plans. I don't want to adjust my plans to God's. You hear the difference there? But he was right on. If I was not willing to adjust to the plans that God had in mind for his church, the church wasn't going to go anywhere. And so I ask you today, Are you willing to adjust your plans, not only personally for all the changes and transitions you go through for God's plans, but are you willing to adjust your understanding and plans for the church to God's plans? One of the things I loved about being on staff here years ago at the turn of the century is that even though the church is many ways the same, there's a lot of things that are a lot different. But you know what? There's a lot of things that we do the same way we did back 17 years ago when the church was a lot different. In many ways, we have not adjusted to the changes and the conflicts and the opportunities that are there. We have not really adjusted our plans to God's plans. In some ways, we have. But in other ways, we we love being a part of a big church, but we still operate like a church that has 120 people in it. And that's a great challenge to have. None of us want to lose that intimacy. None of us want to not be connected with one another. None of us want to feel like an outsider coming in. I get that. But we also have to be willing to understand how God is moving. What's the spirit of God that's moving and what does that look like? And how can we change our plans to God's plans? And I can tell you, I don't really know the answer to that yet. Can I, some of that may be disappointing to you that you wish I would give you like a five-point plan as to how that's all going to happen. Can I tell you that even generals in the field in military exercises, they have an objective but they don't always know the details as to how that objective is going to be executed. You know that, and if you've been in the military, you understand that. You have to be able to adjust. You have to be open to seeing what's going on in the field at that moment, just like the original 12 were. And that's the season that we're entering into. And for some of you, you're thinking, what does this have to do with me personally in my walk with Jesus Christ? Can I tell you, one, being a disciple of Jesus Christ is not just about consuming Being a part of the body of Christ means that you are connected with one another and that as we are able to change and adjust, then more people are willing to come in and adjust and meet Jesus Christ. So we all have a stake in this matter. How are you willing to adjust your plans for God's plans? So when I took Jacob down to school this week, a lot of adjustments going on because I just dropped off Caleb and Rebecca. And I cried like a baby all morning. Can I just be honest with you? I know I'm a man, and I'm the senior pastor, but your senior pastor, who is a man, bawled like a baby on the phone when I was calling Michelle and telling her what was going on. It's because there's adjustments taking place. There are new seasons. And that which used to be is no longer. There are new normals, right? And we have to adjust to that. And I'm thankful that I have a wife who we can adjust to that new normal together with. And I have kids who are in that time of transition and change. And we're all in this thing together. And we're all going to experience it together. Just like you all are going to experience change and transition and new realities, not only in your life right now, but in the life of the church. Are you willing to adjust your plans and adjust your understanding of walking with Christ and adjust your understanding of the church to God's plans? Because if you are, there's no telling what the Lord has in store for you. If you're not, there's no telling what the Lord has in store for you. 
In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. Can we take a few minutes to celebrate communion? Each week we want to remember that it doesn't depend on the sermon, and it doesn't depend on the music, it depends on the grace of Jesus Christ. And so what we remember is that each, not each time that we do this, we remember that on the night in which Christ gave himself up for us, he had dinner with his disciples, and he took a loaf of bread, and he gave thanks to God, broke the bread, passed it amongst his disciples, and said, take and eat, each of you. This is my body, which is broken for you and for many, for the forgiveness of sins. As often as you take it, do it in remembrance of me. He then took the cup, and he gave thanks to God, passed it amongst his disciples, and said, take and drink, each of you. This is my blood, which is poured out for you and for many, for the forgiveness of sins. As often as you take it, do it in remembrance of me. So although we are many, we share the one body and one blood of Jesus Christ. If you are a guest of ours today, you're welcome at this table. If you have lived a pretty selfish life this week, you're welcome at this table. If you have bent over backwards serving other people, you're welcome at this table because it's really not about what you bring to the table. It's about what Christ has brought to the table that you're welcome at. And so we want you all to participate. When you come forward, we're going to invite you to come down the center aisle and the side aisles. You'll have different stations. If you'll come with your hands cupped, you'll have a piece of the bread placed in the palm of your hand. If you'll take that bread, dip it in the cup, place it in your mouth, and then you can spend some time at the prayer rails. Would you please pray with me? And at the end, we'll close in the Lord's Prayer. Lord Jesus, thank you so much for this day. Thank you for your grace. We pray your blessing upon this bread and upon this cup that they will be for us, your real tangible presence. So that as we leave this place today, we leave with you in us and leading us and chasing after us. God, as we pray to you, we humble ourselves before you. And we use the words that your son and our savior taught us to pray. Our father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let us come and feast at the table of the Lord.
Pray that you receive the grace of Jesus Christ, that you receive the power of the Holy Spirit, that you stand on the promises of God's grace and love for you. That as you leave this place today, you open yourself up to the possibility of having your plans adjusted by God's plans. Because it's not just for you, it's for the people out there that God is wanting to use you to reach. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and all of God's people said, Amen. you'll have a great week. We'll see you next Sunday.